Okay, so today we're going to be taking a look at the lore book of Redimir. We're going to open up those pages and learn a little bit more about the world. Now, this topic is somewhat tangential to the main series uh, in terms of board game design. Um, we're not going to be focused on mechanisms or how this applies to the game specifically, but um, I think there is a connection that's worth noting, which is that... Um, you know, when we speak about writers, and, you know, Tolkien is a great example, we say that, um, you know, it should seem, when you're reading a book, that the author knows everything about the world, whether they actually do or not. Um, but, you know, with someone like Tolkien, you really have that sense, because he really did spend a lot of time, many, many years of his life, this was his life's work, um, working through that history, and, uh, you know, if you're familiar with him, the, the uh, linguistics, and, and really, you know, fleshing out this world, exploring it in, in, in great detail, going back into the history, um, you know, things that never obviously appear, in, let's say, The Lord of the Rings um, and The Hobbit, but that um, are there, are, are noted in those stories, are referred to in those stories. They lend a foundation to really support those stories. And in the same way with your game, uh, depending on the nature of your game, if your game is highly thematic and you're really trying to bring forth a world, um, then it's good to have that foundation to really know a lot about it and for me it's just a big part of the enjoyment I get out of it and that's the whole reason why I do this to begin with is the enjoyment of doing it um, so depending on your goals that may vary um, if you're just interested in the, the mechanical aspects you could skip past here and, and move on uh, to the next video but um, if, if you do like writing you do like creating stories characters and and you like having your game um, feel rich thematically then this is, might be something of, of interest to you. So let's take a look uh, how we're going to approach this. We're not going to go through every single entry. We looked at some of them during the other videos. But we are going to um, try and kind of flesh out some of the story arcs and, and um, you know historical items of note. So we looked at this last time that there were some changes made. I also uh, additionally made some more changes to the years and things like that, and as this thing evolves, um, these things will probably change even more. Um, because, see, we are starting here at the year 275. So we probably would want to at some point go back to year zero and find out why that's year zero. You know, because history has to start somewhere for some reason. Um, and so we would want to take a look at what that was. Um, but I haven't gone there and started digging yet, so I don't know what's going on with that. No doubt we'll be led there eventually. Um, so hopefully we'll get to go through most of this, but I am going to jump around a bit uh, to flesh out the stories as we go. Now we looked at Adula a little bit, the uh, legendary warrior of Xanth folklore. Um, and we added on a little bit to her entry. So, to quickly go through it again, um, she is said to have harnessed the power of the subconscious mind to deliver perfectly precise strikes to her enemies. And that related to a, a piece of equipment that we had in the game, um, a relic from her that uh, gave additional combat to units. Okay, so now, we said that, um, that uh, um, she was instrumental in the liberation of the Xanth from the grips of servitude during the hundred year period when giants controlled the northern orc lands. See the vast advance. Okay, so let's see the vast advance before we move forward. The vast advance is a legendary event that brought the monolith giants to Redimir from across the northern sea. According to Xanth chronologies, Around the year 375, the seas were made low by an unexplained act of magic near Gully Cove, originating in the ancient lands of Ant Antogia. Antogia, I think is the pronunciation I had in mind for this. <laughs> Antogia. The giants marched south into Redimir through the low waters and moved into Canton Fields and the Orc lands to the west. Okay, so these giants come across the sea. Um, and <clears throat> obviously great conflicts ensue from that. Uh, the men, elves, and orcs of the land were not equipped to deal with that at the time. The monolith took over for a period of about 125 years, I think, if we look at the chronology. Um, and yeah, we changed this number to 275 to 400. So, um, 
have to go back and change that. But um, yeah, so there was there was a long period where they were under the thumb of these giants. Um, now Adula was um, instrumental in what's called the Monolith Accord, which was an event that happened at the end of that era. Okay, so let's take a look at the era. The period between the years 275 and 400, when the monolith giants dominated Redemir. A dark age that saw much progress overthrown, and a regression of civilized cultures into a state of primitive survival. The monoliths enslaved many of Redemir's people, and decimated the land for a period of over a hundred years until a conflict between the emergent Deator faction and the other giant tribes ushered in the peaceful and productive restitution era. So the Deator were uh, a faction of giants who um, were rebels of a sort against this monolith occupation, not necessarily on moral grounds, but just that they thought their people were better served maybe returning to Deator, uh, returning to Antogia. Because, you know, think about it, this is a period of 125 years. Now, um, let's say the lifespan of giants is somewhere in the 50 to 60 year range, or something like that. Um, and so, over this period of time, you know, the original ones who came aren't the same ones who are there now, at the end of this monolithic period. So, you know, as is common, uh, you know, the youth of the culture is not necessarily on board with what the previous generation was doing. And also, there's always kind of this nostalgia for a time you never saw. Uh, a, a place of origin that you never saw. And so the giants here are amongst these men and dwarves and elves and orcs, and it's like, why? Why don't we go back to where we can, where we can thrive? Why are we out here on this frontier? You know, and, you know, the, the, the giants who came across were of a certain type. You know, we discussed this idea before. And, you know, this idea um, is something that uh, is noted in the evolution of the Americas, you know, that the people who came here and settled were not just your everyday citizens. I mean, to get on a boat and come across and, you know, take a chance in this new world was a drastic move for people. You either had to be very desperate or very aggressive and ambitious to do so. You know, it's like the people who moved out west with the gold rush. These weren't just, you know, your average everyday people. You know, these were these were aggressive people. And so the same thing with these giants. So when they set up the lands here, you know, they didn't just set it up to build homes and sit by the fire and read books. I mean, they enslaved, they were ambitious, they were, you know, um, trying to, you know, um, uh, exceed what was possible in their former land. And, and so there's a certain uh, culture there that these, these people of the Deator faction um, found disagreeable. They wanted to go back to, um, you know, normal life and go back to the, the, the tales they heard of their old land, of the homeland, which always seems so, um, you know, glorious in the telling, you know, how much things were, you know, how things were in the old land in the old times and getting back to your origins and whatnot. So they wanted to move out of this, this place. And um, uh, they, d they came to um, an agreement, you can see here the monolith accord, with the native people of the land, the men, elves, and so forth. The accord was an unofficial alliance between the Deator faction of monolith giants and the native races of Redemir, particularly the starborn elves. Fighting side by side, they relinquished control of the land from giants, ushering in the restitution era. So they kind of, kind of um, unofficially um, formed this alliance with the, with the natives to, you know, combat the other giants of the land and just kill this whole operation and, and go back to where they came from. And they succeeded in that. And that's what freed uh, the native people of Redemir from this giant occupation. What happened to the giants after that, maybe we'll get into at some other point, but it's not here. Okay, so Adula was a warrior who was instrumental in that movement. She was a champion of the Xanth who fought alongside the Deator. Um, okay, so after that, when they got the giants out of their land, she was crowned the first queen of Xanthus for obvious reasons, being a champion of this freedom fight. Uh, taking power at the beginning of the Restitution Era. In addition to being remembered for her heroism, she is also a controversial figure amongst historians, 
due to her questionable decision to move her people east subsequent to the war. So out of Canton Fields, back into those, what we now call the Orklands. Um, away from the men and elves of Canton Fields. Many cite this move as the primary cause for the division and growing animosity between the races that eventually led to the Orc time. So, this was a pivotal point. Orcs, men, elves, etc. were uh, joined together in this movement to free themselves of this uh, occupation. It was an opportunity to maintain that friendship going forward. But Adula made the choice to take her people back east into the Orc lands, away from Canton Fields. And so then as the history developed, the divide between the races deepened, and uh, as such is the case often, uh, animosity bred between the races as well. And so now years later, many years later, after the restitution era, um, you know, the pendulum swings back, and, um, you know, now we're looking at uh, a return of the orcs into Canton Fields, but now, you know, with a lot of uh, heated animosity. Okay, so that's what makes Adula a controversial historical figure. Now, we have another figure who was brought in via a piece of equipment that I recently wrote for the game, um, who um, kind of runs parallel uh, here, and we're going to go to him now. Okay, Nathan of Croy, okay, the monolithic era into the restitution era, um, a headstrong freedom fighter. Born in the latter days of the Monolithic Era, Nathan of Croy was at the forefront of the movement to rid Redemir of Monolith control. So this is a man, and um, in similar fashion to Adula, you know, you can imagine these slave camps and whatnot. He's one of those guys, you know, at night, gathering people around and saying, we got to do something about this, you know, maybe making raids on supplies, maybe taking out a giant if they can, you know, sort of like, <clears throat> you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the, uh, you know, the biography of Fidel Castro, but, you know, a lot of times, this is how people get started. You know, they gather people around them, uh, uh, you know, in, in a rebellious spirit to try and, you know, uh, move themselves, move their people into a new era. And, and that's how Nathan of Croy started. He'll end up a little bit different than Fidel Castro, but uh, just parallels that come to mind as I'm talking about this. Um... He fought alongside other notable champions during the Accord, and subsequently became the first sovereign ruler of men, ushering in the Restitution Era. So similar to Adula, you know, the champions were kind of looked to for leadership going forward, because we've been under occupation for 125 years, no one who was originally under the occupation is still alive today, so the people who are still alive are... Um, you know, don't know how to survive. You know, it's like someone who spent their life in prison coming out when they're 50 years old. It's like, how do I survive? How do I make a life for myself in this new world? So they were looking for leadership. They were desperate, um, you know, for someone to kind of usher in this new era. And so you saw this, this common um, emotional reaction. Okay, so Nathan of Croy... Uh, his reign was one of peace and progress, lasting nearly 70 years. Near the end of his days, however, the reactionary zeal that accompanied newly acquired freedom had progressively waned, and upon his death the people of Canton Fields opted to move away from an autocratic model of government. Consequently, Nathan of Croy stands as the only man to ever hold absolute power in Redemir. Okay, so they basically crowned him king. <laughs> you know, now you could think of this something like... Um, uh, you know, in The Hobbit with, with Bard the Bowman, right? They wanted Bard to be the, the ruler after after uh, he took out Smog. You know, they, they saw him as the figure to lead them going forward. And this is kind of the feeling here. We've just been released from this oppressive influence, and now we're looking for someone to lead us. So they crown him um, with complete power, okay? And he uses that power wisely and to, to, to you know, beneficial effect, but after some time goes by and people are getting used to the new lifestyle and they don't feel like they need to have that one person to lean on, they see where problems could occur with a government of that style. And so they uh, revert back to what they used to do, which is, you know, a different kind of government whereby they make decisions together and whatnot. Okay, so here we have this very unique figure. Um, for the Xanth, it's going to be a little bit of a different story. They're going to maintain that structure. 
all the way until the present where we have the sister twins who rule with absolute power. Of course, they do have you know people around them and stuff like that, but the final word is going to be put forth, forth by them. Um, so here we have this unique uh, historical figure in the history of men, Nathan of Croy. Um, okay, so let's jump back up and move on. Um, just a note here about athletics. Uh, the field of sport is primarily occupied by females across Redemir, particularly as it concerns men and dwarves. The starborn have more male athletes in their games, though these sports are particular to their race and generally ignored by others. Okay, so you could think of something like cricket, which I don't know a lot about it, but my notion of it is that it's played in England. We don't pay any attention to it here in the Americas. You know, uh, I don't know who else does. You know, we have more of like a world culture nowadays, but it's this kind of a thing. It would be like, you know, the Starborn Elves have men in their games, but it's those games that are kind of particular to their region. The, ga the games that are played across the board are, are played by females. And so you see how this lore book, um, it, it also acts as notes to myself to just remember little things about the world. This isn't really a narrative concern. There's not a lot of story here, but it's a note about the world. And, and, and just fleshing out anywhere you can turn an eye and look, we want to have an answer. We want to have something to see. So, you know, if all of a sudden for some reason I'm, I'm made to think of eating utensils in this world, I want to decide what those eating utensils are and how they're used and how they evolved. You see what I mean? So this is just a note on one aspect of the world. Okay, Artemis Harrow we looked at sufficiently uh, during the other videos. Um, the blood orcs we also looked at, but we'll read through it quickly. A savage and warlike, warlike race of orcs with reddish skin, generally characterized by an unruly and unreasonable disposition. Their culture is male-dominated, subjugating a large portion of their female population, though females who prove their might and ruthlessness enjoy the same liberties as males. These females are often greatly feared, being viewed as a dangerous aberration in the course of nature. Might of body and boldness of spirit are the most important factors in their social hierarchy, and all other considerations are secondary or wholly ignored. So when we talked about Reyna, the uh, Blood Oak mercenary, we discussed this a little bit in terms of how that might make makes right idea is paramount, above any, uh, you know, discrimination between the races. Okay, uh, between the genders, I'm sorry. Border Blight Skirmish we looked at uh, sufficiently. Calgrim we also looked at, but we didn't complete his story, so we'll go through that quickly. Um, we know that he made a great escape from the Orcs um, at the very beginning of the Orc Tide, um, and as a result of that is someone who's uh, kind of looked to as a hero. Um, and his tales have gone forward in the, uh, in the lore of the world um, beyond the Orc Tide into the future. Um, so, after surviving a grueling journey through enemy-occupied lands and an unhospitable wilderness, he arrived at the guard post near Stenden, where he was mistaken for an ash white and nearly fired upon by archers before being given quarter and medical attention. He was soon made a general of the fighting men at the front lines of the resistance against the eastward orc insurgents, and later a strategic commander for the northern faction in the Great Mage War. Okay, so at this point in our game we have him as a captain. Okay, so he's here, a general of the fighting men at the front lines of the resistance again against the Orc Tide. Subsequent to this war, which he survives, he'll go on to fight along the northern mage academies in the Great Mage War, which we haven't gotten into at all here. Maybe someday we will if we, if we make that game. That game will be a second installment in the Recitals of Redemir series, sharing all the mechanisms. Um, you know, maybe bringing in something new, but basically the same game with uh, a different layer of theme on it. And so if we ever get to that point, we'll discuss it in greater detail. But basically it's going to be a war that is inspired by the Orktide. And the things that happen in the Orktide are going to make that war, um, you know, possible or, you know, bring it to being. Okay, so he's going to fight in that war as well. Okay, so Cherxis we looked at. The Circle of Ushers. The high seats of leadership at Dawn's Crest, occupied by the Amar. Each area of activity is represented by an Amar, who sits on the Circle of Ushers and guides how the activity should proceed. So we think about, you know, economics, war, these different areas of society each have someone at their head, and um, that person sits on this Circle of Ushers. And I want to talk a little bit about the terminology here because it reflects how the culture thinks. They're ushers. 
they're not uh, you know rulers per se. They're they're um, um, what do I want to say? Like figureheads of guidance, let's say. You know what I mean? They're they're there to represent um, kind of a guiding hand, not not dominance, not control. Okay, so the elves. Um, as we look at them uh, in their own entry, we'll see some other things about them, but they, they respect the individuality of each person, okay? And, um, and so their leaders are not ones who subjugate. They're, they're there just uh, because someone has to kind of be in charge of these things. Someone has to make the final call. Um, but even their seat is subject to review uh, via some mechanism that hasn't been explored. Um, but, you know, there's like a democracy sort of thing going on with them. Okay, so, uh, notable Amar who held seats during the Great War era were Yi, Amar of War, during both the Orktide and the Great Mage War, and Sonori, Amar of Applied Ethereology, whose position gained prominence subsequent to the relinquishing of Dawn's Crest to the sister twins of Xanthus at the end of the Orktide conflict. So, a few things here. Applied ethereology, okay? So, dealing with things ethereal. This terminology is also reflective of the culture. They're a scientific culture. This is a sort of an antiquated uh, subject, uh, field of study. Uh, and so they, they give it this scientific name to kind of, you know, uh, bring it into the fold, kind of make it less of a point of embarrassment, this investigation into these matters. Okay, so you see how a scientific culture would deal with these things in this complex history, which includes this type of uh, study, but we, we want to kind of make it sound a little bit more like it's coming in line with science, okay? Which, of course, there may be a scientific aspect to it, but not, not in the same way as physics or, you know, whatever. Okay, so um, now her position gained prominence at the end of the Orktide, because if you haven't gathered yet, um, the the orcs won the Orktide. They took over Canton Fields. Now, when we play this game, we could be said uh, to be playing a series of battles within the larger war. Um, and so either faction may win those battles. But as the history stands, the orcs uh, route the men and elves out of Canton Fields, they move west into Dawn, um, and, you know, that upheaval is a, is a lot of what inspires the Great Mage War, the loss, they're dealing with that loss, um, their blame, uh, and where that blame lands in that loss, um, you know, of course, a lot of that blame is going to go on the orcs, but the orcs just defeated them, they're not you know, they're, they're not going to get spanked right now. We're going to be spanking each other over this because, you know, it's like, well, you screwed it up and you this and that. And so this is all kind of part of what inspires that second war, which is very unfortunate and tragic uh, historical event. Hopefully we'll get to look at it someday. Okay, so Sonori was actually included in the game. We, we haven't looked at her in this series yet, but we will. When these cards are all done, I'm going to come back and make a video going through all of them uh, as we go into playtesting. Okay, so, um, so yeah, this is the Circle of Ushers. This is how the government kind of works at Dawn's Crest. Um, the clay pools are not in this game. Okay, it's just an area of the world. Um, the Crystal Crypt is not part of this game. It's an area in Dawn. Um, it's, as you see, at during the um, Emergence Era, the Crystal Crypt is instrumental in... Um, what's going on during that era, and it basically is an era whereby um, magic, which was previously um, only accessible to those who have a natural um, proclivity toward it, towards what they call adepts, right, is now going to be um, brought into a technological form that anyone can use. Okay, and so we call that the emergence era, when magic comes to the fore as it becomes more prolifically available. Okay, so we're not going to look at the Crystal Crypt here. Um, the Darkling Clan is also in the modern era. Um, the Deator Monoliths we spoke about a little bit. 
so let's get their, their entry out here. Uh, the Diator were a western faction of giants that emerged at the end of the monolithic era. They were thought to be gods incarnate by the inhabitants of Redemir. By the native inhabitants, not the other giants, but the men elves, etc. Um, due to their efforts towards salvation and liberation for the native races. So they had their own reasons for doing this, but to the natives, um, who again, remember, there was a lot of regression of progress destruction of their education. This thing went on for 125 years. The people who were alive at the end of this thing did not have the benefits of culture. Um, and so they are somewhat primitive in that way, although it's only been 125 years, so a lot of the, you know, things are maintained, but that, you know, uh, official academic study is no longer available. It's just word of mouth, you know, oral tradition and whatnot. Um, and so they, they look at the Diator as gods come to save them. Okay, because they, they had no hope before this. They could not overthrow the giants. Their ability to do so reduced over time. It didn't get stronger because all the things they had available to them at the beginning of this, though they were put on their heels because they weren't ready for it, they still were an established peoples. At this point, they're enslaved, disparate, you know, placed in camps, placed in, you know, regions that they can't get out of, they can't talk to each other. They're they're not they're in less of a position to overthrow than they were when they when the giants first came. So they have no hope and now here hope comes in the most unlikely of forms. So they looked at this as the, you know, the hand of the gods stepping in for their benefit. Um, the Diator's close association with elves is thought to be the inspiration for their radical philosophy and subsequent overthrow of monolith power. Um, they I guess had control over the elves um, you know, had much dealing with the elves, and so some of their exchange perhaps affected their philosophy. Um, after forming an alliance with the native races known as the Accord, the Diator were responsible for pressing the other monolith factions deeper and deeper into the east, and eventually crushing them between what is now known as the Great Defender and Fawn Mountain Ranges, with persistent rear assaults. So, Canton Fields, right, which is kind of a central location, um, because you have the Orklands to the west and Dawn to the east, um, they're going to push, slowly push the other monoliths out of Canton Fields into Dawn and across Dawn into the east against um, a, f a mountain range in that area. Uh, and, the, and the monoliths were, the other monolith factions were unable to resist these rear assaults and were crushed against the mountains and defeated. Okay. Soon thereafter, the Diator mysteriously disappeared, further supporting the notion that they were of supernatural origin. Bearded warrior giants in golden armor and winged helmets. Okay, so their mysterious disappearance. Whether or not it's actually magical or they just left of their own accord and nobody noticed how they did it or whatever. Because remember, there was a, a magical occurrence that lowered the waters, allowing them to initially come through. And who did that and why is something we haven't explored yet. But now... That's no longer the case. So where they went and how they got there, nobody knows. That's a mystery, and we may look at it at some point, because um, if you if you recall, um, one of our games was going to be Recitals of Redemir the Monolith Accord. So we were going to look at that war. Now, whether or not that would uh, expand outward to what happened after that war, probably not, but there may be notes about it, uh, let's say at the end of that rule book where we talk about a little bit of the lore and flesh out some of the theme. So we'll probably at some point explore how the Diator left, or maybe it's just a mystery in terms of Redemir's historical accounts. Um, if we ever go to um, uh, Antogia, then maybe you know, and we may in some other games at some point, that's kind of a wild land of uh, adventure and whatnot, because there you have giants and all kinds of weird creatures out that way. That's across the sea to the north, if you recall the map that we had. Um, that's not included there. That's that's a way. So, uh, you know, if we ever go there, we'll, we may find out more about the Diator and what happened to them. Okay. <coughs> Dignitary, Dignitary packs we looked at, as well as Hawkbeak, Dunesboro, um, the Dwarves. Mm, I guess we'll go into it here because it's a point of interest. Um, just the different races and whatnot. Some of this has changed a little bit, I think, and I haven't come in here and changed it, but I'll see as we go. Generally respected as learned, keen, and wise, dwarves can be found seated at councils throughout Redemir, often being sought as counselors by those holding governmental or military power. Known for their ingenuity in the areas of magic and alchemy, and their often uh, eccentric and bizarre customs, 
there are few who hold outright enmity for these stewards of knowledge and wisdom. Okay, so remember when we were talking about Osiah Lux, that they're the premier culture of, of Redemir. Okay, so we have two subsets of dwarves besides those dwarves of Osiah Lux that we've been concerning ourselves with. We noted the Ferran as a possible faction group in an expansion for the game. These are um, mystic shapeshifters who live clandestine lifestyles largely, largely out of the reach of society, hidden in densely wooded or mountainous regions. The Ferran are not quite suited for public life, though they do maintain a complementary relationship with the dwarves of the major cities. Okay, so you get the idea. Now, the Sea Ferran. These deep sea dwarves are shapeshifters who, for all intents and purposes, have adopted a permanent form somewhere between a dwarf and a fish. They walk upright while on land with their large tail fin dragging behind, and their faces are snout like and gaunt, though bearded still, though they commonly have little hair on their heads. Their focus is on the production of light bearing items for underwater and surface dwelling peoples made from raw lumen, acquired from their economic partners, the Uros. Rarely do they appear on land, except when invited for some political or economic purpose, at which point their hosts are reminded of their exceedingly bizarre, bizarre manner, and their welcome is often quite short. Okay, so they're a bizarre lot. These fish dwarves, um, who, who are ferrant shapeshifters, who kind of permanent, permanently adopted an aquatic form. Okay. We discussed last time how the dwarves were sea miners. This relationship is all part of that. In addition to the relationship with the Uros, so let's take a quick look at who they are. The Uros, a small amphibious newt-like race of deep sea dwelling hunters. And when I say small, I mean really small. I mean like maybe, I don't know, 10 inches tall or something like that. Their underwater cities are enclosed, shielded from the ocean, and they venture out for hunting excursions and other endeavors. Their primary quarry are the various creatures of the depths who provide lumen, a phosphorus organic chemical used in the production of lamps and related items. Uh, they can be brash and proud and almost never smile or laugh, but they are amicable enough with their economic partners, the seafaring dwarves, and can usually attend political gatherings with surface dwellers without damaging relationships beyond repair. Okay, so they are a strange lot as well. Um, they do better dealing with the, the seafaring than they do with the other uh, land inhabitants, but it's all okay. We could work it out, especially for the sake of lumen, which is a tremendous, tremendously important product because it provides light, um, which we know is essential to, to almost every aspect of a culture. So that's the Urus um, and uh, their relationship with these uh, seafaring dwarves. Okay, so we may get a deeper look at the Ferran if we do go into that expansion. Whether the Sea Ferran will be part of that, I don't know. Um, because, you know, we probably wouldn't be going into the sea, and they pretty much stay there for the most part. But they may show up in some form. Okay, so now let's take a look at the Elves. The Elves of Redemir have a long but shadowed history. For time immemorial, two subgroups of Elves have existed in a state of disparity and antipathy. Okay, so we talked about the Starborn. These are the main elves that we're dealing with. The Fleck we have not looked at. They're going to come into play in later games. Um, and so uh, let's just quickly look at them. The Fleck are elves in their most primitive state, a swarming horde of gray-skinned, barbarous savages. Fleck elves are despised by all the races of the civilized world. These chaotic creatures are little more than beasts, with the unfortunate addition of mental faculties capable of devising vile schemes and torturous contraptions. All right, now this is something we didn't speak about, and it's something that's been evolving. It's been in process during this series as I'm working on these these uh, these notes on my own. Um, and I even moved some cards around to represent this. Um, that the elves of Dawn's Crest are not to be thought of as the typical high elf. They're, they're very technological, and they're focused on invention and uh, mechanical things and stuff like that. More something that you typically associate with a dwarf or a gnome. Um, and, of course, they have their own elvish style about them. Um, an aesthetic sense as well, which is something worthy of note. I always think of this in terms of uh, Western culture versus uh, Eastern, particularly Oriental culture, but Indian as well. You know, like how when we build a building, it's just like this this, this rectangle. And now, of course, we live in a, in a, in a somewhat homogenized culture nowadays, so you're going to see this throughout. But generally speaking, when you go, you know, and, and 
of course, you know, Western culture also has had much beauty in, in what it's created. But in terms of modern culture, um, you look at the practicality, particularly in America, the, the practicality of, of what we create with that lack of aesthetics. Whereas even to this day, when you look at a Japanese product, I, I'm, I'm a collector of toys. And this is very evident here. You'll look at something like uh, the Transformers, which have always been kind of produced across both countries um, at the same time using you know the same molds. So you have two of the same toy. The American version has this cheap, lousy paint application on it, comes in a you know a bubble card package maybe the card is is you know hardly even specific to the character it may not even tell you anything about the character at times you know whereas you look at the japanese version uh, sometimes made of a higher quality plastic much more um beautiful paint applications on it comes in a package that might include a booklet about the world or you know pictures and this and that you know just a greater aesthetic sense, a greater focus on that as a culture. Okay, now, this is dubious, I know, and, you know, is subject for some debate. But this is the notion that I have, is that the, the Starborn Elves um, have that aesthetic sense. But as an overall culture of Elves, this notion of contraptions, of being inventive, this is, this is inherent in, the, in their race. Okay, so the Fleck. They have a deep hatred for creatures of all other races and oftentimes even each other and will take every opportunity to tear down what others have built. Okay, so you see like a bizarro thing going on here? (laughs) Building things up is inherent in their culture. The Fleck, who are kind of like, you know, the bad side of the stick, tearing things down is, is a big part of what they enjoy doing. Okay. There is no enemy, however, that they despise more passionately than the Starborn Elves. The successful theft, sabotage, or destruction of Starborn advancements is a source of great pride for a Fleck whelp, and proof of a murdered Starborn could put them on the road to leadership. Okay, so you see they're kind of like an opposite to the Starborn. Now let's see the Starborn and why this came about in this way. Okay. So, the Starborn's own historical accounts describe an ancient interaction between a segment of the ancient elf population occupying a lowland area called the Basin, and illustrious beings of great power who arrived from the night sky, referred to in lore as the Granters. So you have elves spread across the land. A particular sect of them in this area called the Basin are visited by these illustrious beings of great power who arrived from the night sky. Okay, known as the Granters. So now, you know, wherever they came from, that's we could talk about that at another time. But with the aid of these mysterious entities of unknown origin, these elves were given great power to create and elevate, bringing rapid progress to the world and to their own people. While men and orcs struggled in the wilds and dwarves toiled in far-off lands, these elves, known as Starborn, built great towers of learning and institutes of innovation and production. The Starborn thrived in relative seclusion, laying the foundation for the modern world without much input or interruption from the other races, for they far exceeded their measure in almost every way. In time, however, the Starborn fell victim to lethargy, and seeing their position as superior, they hired out the tiresome work, um, the tiresome work of progress to the more eager men of the region. In time, men became masters of craft, and dwarves emerged in large numbers from the far west, settling in elf lands to ply their trades and further their academic research. The Starborn found relations with the other races tiresome, and eventually withdrew to the eastern mountains to form Dawn's Crest, a lavish cavern city of glorious halls set deep within the stony peaks, where they now reside almost exclusively. Almost exclusively, because we do have, for instance, the Powderwood Elves, who live outside of Dawn's Crest, but who are also starborn. Okay, so you, so you have this idea of, let's call it an alien technology um, that comes in and speeds up progress. <coughs> and um, so the starborn have this, this inherent um, ingenuity coupled with this um, kind of, you know, steroid shot of, of progress. Okay, and so you see how they uh, have evolved into the culture I described as uh, one that's very scientific. Um, and, and so this is instrumental to understanding their culture, that they're not 
um, you know, these magical creatures that we typically think of. Magic is part of every race in the world, but their focus is on uh, scientific um, progress. Okay. All elves are immune to fire and retain the mobility and flexibility of youth through all the years of their life, barring injury or poor health maintenance. This would uh, uh, apply to both the Fleck and the Starborn. Elves do not use surnames, and to the best of anyone's knowledge, no two elves have ever shared a name. This convention reflects the culture's acknowledgement of each elf as an individual, unlike any who has come before. Okay, so they have no last names, they have one name, and that name is unique. They don't name themselves after other people, they don't have names that are common in their culture. Each elf is named differently, at least to the best of anyone's knowledge. I mean, you know, maybe 200 years ago someone came up with the same idea. Nobody knows if that happened, but if an elf name is known, it is not used again. Okay. Um, Executor Sentry serves under a Mars Sonori. So this is an elf who got included in the game that we haven't looked at yet. Perhaps we will at some time. Um, executives wor work under the Amar, so it's like the next level of leadership or, you know, people working in the various fields. Um, the Forgotten, <coughs> uh, this is something we haven't investigated yet, though we, though we probably will um, during the Great Mage War, because this happens in, in the same era that we're looking at. Um, it's a group of historical citizen warriors who were lost in a Donner Party type of event whereby their rescue was stalled and eventually abandoned due to territory politics. Their restless spirits now torment the living, and in their new state they have developed bizarre forms and strange ethereal allies. So we have these guys coming in uh, later games that take place in the modern era as ghosts. Basically, now if you're familiar with the story of the Donner Party, it's a tragic event whereby these families who were trying to move west wound up isolated um, uh, in the snow, and um, a series of unfortunate events for them. Some of them did survive. So if you haven't looked into it, it's a fascinating story, and there's a great documentary about it. Uh, I think on YouTube. Um, but basically, to get stranded. Now, the, the Donner Party was stranded, and you know. People had trouble trying to rescue them. Here, the rescue was stalled and eventually abandoned due to territory politics. Well, you can't go in there and do that. You know, you have to this, that, and the other thing. You know, so where they were was inaccessible due to politics. And this makes their restless spirit situation, you see, because they weren't rescued. They could have been, and they weren't because of selfishness, uh, you know, a lack of focus on compassion and whatnot. And so they become these terrors, you know, who uh, who haunt the living to this day. Um, Gorfin the Harrower? I don't believe we've seen him in this game. He's in another game, The Clash of the Orc Lords. The Clash of the Orc Lords, just to mention it here, uh, takes place after the Orc Tide, um, when the orcs have taken over Canton Fields, and now they have to sort out their power structure, who's going to have which areas of control and whatnot. And the Clash of the Orc Lords is a game that focuses on those orc lords working that out, and it includes all six of the known uh, orc cl clans. Okay, Gorfiend is um, a, a blood orc in that game. Uh, a rogue blood orc mercenary whose courage and ferocity inspired more than a few who despised his race. He led numerous southern offensive charges in the Great Mage War. Okay, so Gorfiend, um, he is, he kind of crosses the boundaries a little bit. Remember, the, 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 the orcs and the other native races are not completely disparate. They did share that common history, um, during the monolithic era, um, and so there is some crossover. Gorfiend is an example of that. He's a rogue Blood Orc mercenary. And he will come into play during the Great Mage War, which is mainly does not involve the Orcs. But there are Orcs present in the area of Dawn, who live peaceably amongst the other people. Um, and he's going to be one of them who, you know, fights um, for the Southern Faction. The Southern Faction is much more open to uh, including Orcs amongst them than the Northern Faction is. The Northern Faction, again, as we remember... Um, is comprised of many people who originated in Canton Fields, and so there's a lot of bitterness after the Orc Tide in the Northern Faction concerning Orcs. Okay, so there is a racial component to this. Um, so he's going to fight for the Southern Faction. Um, okay, Gorgolith, we looked at last time. Um, a a giant-like gluttonous beast who feeds upon its enemies. Uh, solitary creatures whose numbers are few. They are vaguely reminiscent of and rumored to be descendant from the great monoliths. 
Okay, so there's some speculation about their origin. Um, the Great Mage War is a conflict between the Northern Mage Academies and the Southern Guild Mages uh, between these years, and that we would look at in that second installment of the game, perhaps. I don't want to get into that too much right now, as much as it's interesting. It doesn't really um, apply too much to what we were talking about. Um, if you want to pause it and read it, you can, but eventually we're going to get to this, and so we'll we'll leave it for that for that time. Okay, but I'll I'll give it to you here. If you want to read it, you can pause it here and take a look. Okay, so um, Grandel Tubert is from another game. He's basically a, a wrangler of these beasts that people use as mounts. Um, Gaia Watch Keep. High upon the western ridge of the Tarn beneath Bankston. The Tarn is beneath Bankston, not Gaia Watch Keep. High upon the western ridge of the Tarn beneath Bankston stands Gaia Watch Keep. A strong and ancient defensive outpost. It is one of few structures to survive the monolithic era. Its position overlooking the fertile valley below High Ridge, which is where Bankston is, has historically made it a particularly desirable location. Control of the keep has been oft contested, and it has housed many various factions throughout the long years. Okay, so it's the standing keep that, you know, occupiers come in and take over and use. You know, nobody just destroys it. They, they occupy it. And so it stands uh, throughout the history. Uh, Hardwood Harbor is from the modern era. We won't be looking at that right now. Um, Marshall Adam, I made an entry here for him, but I didn't write anything about him. If you remember, Marshall Adam is in the game. He's one of the cards that we have, but I didn't flesh out his story yet. So we'll have to take a look at that at another time. We looked at the uh, monolithic cord in that era. Um, Nathan, the, the Orc Tide, we're very familiar with that is. Osaya Lux, we looked at as well. Pewter Canal um, is an area of dawn that will come up in later games. Um, Powderwood. An ashen woodland in the southeast where dust and debris from the rare indigenous trees covers every surface. A small grouping of elves resides there, objectors to the lifestyle of their dawn's crest kin. The Powderwood elves are hardy and strong folk. They get along well with men and do hard work with stone, wood, and metal. It is common for them to wear a light plate armor and be proficient with many weapons, though their link with magic is less prolific than is found with the elves of the mountain. They can be stern at times, but are quick to laugh when the day is done, and have even been known to fancy their mead, a very unusual quality for an elf. Okay, so you're getting that sense that I spoke about of, a, of a, an elf that is more... Uh, alike to men and dwarves than the uh, elves of Dawn's Crest. Okay. Uh, ridges, again, they're going to come in in the modern era. Shadehaven um, exists in Dawn uh, at the time of, um, at the end of the Great War era, but it's primarily um, a modern era location. So this is a penumbra as well. Um, these are all modern. Uh, factions. Soberhold, the largest and most fortified historical establishment of the Concord Orcs. It served as the seat of power for War Sage Grave, his name is Grave Song, of the Great War Era and developed into a prosperous, bustling hub of culture for the Northwestern Orc clan. It still survives and thrives in the modern era. So Soberhold is held firm. Um, and again, because of the Concord Orcs and their nature, their diplomatic nature, uh, they do have strength. Uh, in war terms, but they don't, they, you know, they, they're not imperial, and so they've been able to survive uh, the history. Okay, and now we have Sonori, Amar Sonori, who we spoke about as the uh, Amar of Applied Ethereology at Dawn's Crest. A young, dark-haired elf female, voracious in her desire for philosophical knowledge, um, and I would say metaphysical knowledge as well here. Sonori was given a seat at the Circle of Ushers at Dawn's Crest as the Amar of Applied Ethereology, despite her youth, primarily because the seat is generally regarded as little more than an honorary relic of the past. Being a highly technological culture, the elves of Dawn Crest view her area of study to be somewhat abstract and impractical, um, turning, to things, turning to things ethereal only when where science fails. Sonori pursues her field with great gusto, however, and does not accept her seat as representing a lesser position, nor is she willing to conform to the deeply rooted, often antiquated perspectives of the other Ramar. 
Subsequent to the loss of Dawn's crest to the Xanth following the Orktide, Sonori came to prominence as the elves sought alternative solutions to the crisis of their expulsion and the bitter conflict raging in the east which gave rise to the Great Mage War. Okay, so they're going to look to Sonori. She's going to grow into a major hero of this story going forward because um, her area of study, which is generally disregarded in, in, in peacetime, all of a sudden, um, you know, in their desperate you know, search for something to help, they're going to turn to the ethereal, which we spoke about a little bit when we spoke about the Deator. You know, when you're desperate, you know, looking for the hand of God to step in. And so that's a similar kind of notion to what we have here. So Sonori's going to come to prominence. And then again, we're going to be going into the great mage war where we're dealing with magic. And so um, what she deals with is going to be a little bit more closely linked to, to that conflict. But she does appear in this game. I wrote her in. Uh, we haven't seen her in this series yet, but we will. Um, the Starborn, High Rays of Elves, distinguished from the Primitive Fleck, Sea Elves. Uh, I put this note here just because I'm thinking of this as a glossary that eventually may get translated into the game, although probably would have to be reduced. Um, and so someone may want to just look up Starborn and may not think to look at elves, although they probably would. I probably don't need this. I mean, you know that it's elves, so if you didn't see an entry for Starborn, you'd probably go look at elves. But if not, here you can you can get a quick note about them and where to look for more information. Um, Sternus the Adorn we looked at in the game, the Xanthan Minister of Coffers, has a notorious propensity for accepting lavish gifts during periods of nego difficult negotiation, and uh, the Minister is a particularly difficult negotiator. Okay, so that's a variation on the flavor text that we wrote. Um, a r the Swarth are a race of pitch-skinned pirates from the far west beyond the native orc lands. We have a Swarth um, in the game, so just wanted to mention that. Uh, Termis Staghope does not come into this game. Um, the Unified Orc War Clans, as you know, is the alliance of orcs that invaded Canton Fields during the Orktide, the major conflict that began the Great War era. We spoke of the Urus, we looked at the Vast Advance, um, and the Xanthan. The yellow-skinned orcs of Xanthus are an imperial and ethnocentric race, quite secure in their superiority. Their culture is one that insists upon strict propriety, Though this is mostly a facade, as their authoritarian governing bodies are rife with deceit, foul play, and sabotage. Xanthans despise anything that evokes the barbarous history of the orcs, and take elaborate measures to elevate themselves above the other orc races. It is a ubiquitous practice for both male and female citizens to administer an oral tincture daily, which eliminates all hair growth as part of their efforts to distance themselves from the beasts of the fields and the less sophisticated orcs of the other provinces. Okay, so we looked at that a little bit, but here it's all in one place. And Zorn is a major trade city of the Swarth. We do have the Merchant of Zorn in our game, and so we make note of that here. Okay, so very good kind of a brief look we didn't touch on absolutely everything just because it's not relevant and as you see this document could easily be three times the size i haven't put everything in here from all my other games this is this lore book is something i've only come up with you know i don't know when a couple of months ago or something like that and i started moving stuff to here as as needed um but there's a lot of information in my files on the other games that needs to be moved into here to really make this a full full lore book but thanks for checking in i'm glad that um you know, we've come this far and been able to explore all the different areas of making this this one little game that we're talking about. Um, and, and these are all different parts of that process. So I'm glad that we're getting a chance to look at all of this together. And so um, I hope that you guys will be inspired to maybe share what you're doing as well. I would love to see the stories that you're coming up with, the games you're coming up with, how you're implementing, um, you know, your stories into a tabletop format and so forth. And um, we have more to do on this game and, and, and a lifetime's worth of work uh, to do in general. So anyway, I'll see you next time.